Yeah, we on Boss Talk 101. Yeah, we gon' talk, we gon' have fun. We be on fire, we be lit lit. It's a unique hustle, big, big, big shit. Big shit, big shit, big shit. It's a unique hustle, nigga, big shit. Big shit, big shit, big shit. Name another podcast like this. Check it, check it, check it. It's a unique house. It's your boy ECO, and I'm here with the lovely, amazing, official Miss Jamaica. What's going on? Not none of you know my dad walk on. Man, hey, man, we out here still in LA, right on the West Coast. Yes, sir. Man, hey, and uh, we slid over here today, man. We got my boy. You know what? He's a therapist. You know, this is odd for me because I this is my first time really uh, just interviewing a male therapist, right? Right, Steph? Yes, sir. So, so yeah, yeah, Taj, man. Um, I didn't seen you, man. You uh, you you basically doing things that are therapeutic, really, for 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 people who've been through traumatic experiences. Oh yeah, yeah. I specialize in trauma. That's my specialization. What yeah. what made you like get um like what made you get into it? But before we start with that, we like to go back to okay. when you were a child, mm-hmm. where you grew up your family environment oh, you because going all the way back all down the way back that. because we want to know before you start advising somebody else we oh, need to right, know right, all right. about you yeah yeah absolutely. so go ahead and let us know um well the reason why i know a lot about trauma obviously i'm educated but before that i've been through a lot of trauma myself it makes as, sense as most uh you know black folks and people of color in the community have been through mm-hmm. um when you I'm, say trauma give me some examples and how old were you uh, I was probably about four or five when I experienced like my first like shooting. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I saw saw you know like a dead body. Right. Um, and you grew up in Compton. Yeah, uh, I'm originally from Compton, um, but I've lived all over LA at the same time. So when so. you saw that, that was in Compton, right? Yeah, that was yeah. The first time I seen that, I was living in Compton with my moms. Okay, because when I hear about Compton, I I think that that's supposed to be like a regular basis thing that happens all the time. So I mean, it's 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 frequent. I mean, especially at that time. Okay. You know, uh, this was you know this is during the '80s. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I'm an '80s baby, and uh, it was like really turned up at mm-hmm. that at that point. Um, I remember having to like walk to school, um, and. I was already aware of like, yo, I gotta be careful. You know, I was already worried about like, you know, if I saw like a car driving too slow or if I seen a van, you know, anything like that, I was already kind of paranoid and I was already, you know, I'm like in second grade. And did some, you have any older siblings or any other siblings? Um, I had some siblings, but they were uh, they were in, in New Jersey. Okay. Where my pops was at. Um, so wasn't yeah. anybody who educated you and tell you, you know, because I would think that when you're growing up in a certain area, like your parents sit you down and like, don't do this, don't do that, don't look, you know? So yeah. was it anybody who told you or you just picked it I up? I mean, yeah, my mom's was, you know, of course my mom's, you know, would tell me. The thing is, is that I had to learn a lot of it myself because I was a latchkey kid, so my mom was always trying to work. You know, she was always trying to get money, you know, because she was the only person supporting us at the time. Mm-hmm. And um, so I was always by myself. Where was your dad during this time? My pops was in New Jersey at the time. I didn't really know him at that time. Okay. Um, so... Um, shout out to Patterson, New Jersey. You know, I lived there for a little bit mm-hmm. too. Had you seen um, a picture of him? Yeah. Okay, so you knew yeah, who he I, was. I knew who he was, but I didn't know him. Okay, and he never called or anything like that. I mean, till you was what age? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think I first probably knew about my pops when I was like four or five. Okay. And the first time you saw him was when? That I remember, probably like five. Okay. Something okay. like that, four, five. Years so, old. how did you feel? Um, not having your father present because I won't say having a male present because you know you have other males that might be around that influenced you but it's a difference when it's your father you know what I mean so how did it make you feel not having your father around at that age I mean when I saw other people that had like their families Mm -hmm. I would always wonder how that was you know, and um, I try to gravitate to like my uncles Mm -hmm. you know because I would see you know how my cousins had their pops or you know, or other people, because I mean, I was surrounded by people in my in my neighborhood at the time that didn't have their dads too. Right. And so we were always just kicking it together. So mm-hmm. after a while, it's like I didn't even know the difference. Right. You know what I mean? Until um, I actually experienced somebody, you know, taking on that. And role. that's so bad about this generation, because there's so many people we interview that is 
sit right there where you're sitting. And I want to say it's about 80% of them don't have their father in their life growing up. Yeah. A lot of them just was raised by their mom. Right. And I always felt like, especially for little boys, when you're growing up, you need your father in your life, whether you need to go live with your father so he can show you how to be a man. Mm -hmm. You know, because when I start to look at, you know, the psyche of, well, a uh, woman, boys still need a mother in the beginning to show mm -hmm. the nurturing part, the caring Absolutely. part, all of that. But when you reach to a certain age, the father needs to show you how to become a man. Mm -hmm. But... A lot of people don't do that because whether the father have another family, don't want to deal with that child or just different things, and they don't realize that you hurting generations to come. It's not yeah. only your child you're hurting, oh, yeah. but that passes down through him to his kids. Right. And, you know, obviously we all have our positions in life between men and women. You know, we all bring, we bring different things to the table. You know, um, as you said, the mother is a very important part right. of the growing process. Um, that's what establishes what we call attachment. Mm -hmm. And however your attachment is, is how you see the rest of the world. So if you got an insecure attachment, chances are you're gonna be insecure with how you see the rest of the world. You know what I mean? And um, I didn't really understand that until I went to school way wow. later in life. You know what I'm saying? But the, the father definitely, if, if the father's not present, there's a presence that is missing. You know, um, in the world, obviously, again, we have roles, you know, so there was a lot of disciplinary stuff that I didn't get, a lot of guidance. You know, my mom tried her best, you know, because my mom kind of thought like a dude, too, like, because she, you know, she was raised around, she had two brothers. Right. So she kind of knew, but again, she couldn't, she doesn't know what it is to be a man. Exactly. You know what I mean? Just like, I don't know what it is to be a woman. woman right. You know what I mean? And I would never try to, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? That's the high respect I have for women because of my mom. And my sisters so um yeah but nah, when did you decide to be um to follow this path because i know growing up as a kid being a therapist was not in your were you in like gangs or anything like when you first were you in compton yeah. so there's definitely you in a neighborhood oh yeah and it signifies you pretty much yeah, that's the thing. You don't even got to, like... You ain't got to do... Many people talk about jumped in and all yeah, that. Nah, you don't... I mean, these days, it's like, okay, because it's like, all right, well, I don't bang. All right, well, where your mama stay? That's right. Where your daddy stay, you know? And, and so, where you at is... That's where you at. That's where you at. You know what I mean? So, um, I've been I've been around gangs and affiliated with gangs my whole life. Exactly. You know what I mean? So, uh, in different capacities. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that... I knew about the gang shit before I knew about daddies and exactly that. right. You, know you was born in it, yeah, right? You know what I mean. You step outside and you in it. You know when what, it, what when was an incident when you first was young, maybe ten or eleven, when you seen that the gang not only was it gangs in the uh, neighborhood, but it was something that signified the neighborhood and it can get serious. Uh, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, nah. Well, I was walking home from school one day and. Uh, I was walking with a friend of mine at the time. I, we was about, I think we was about 11, yeah. something like that in that age range. And um, he had something on that I knew could get you, you know, right. messed yeah, up. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I told him, I was like, yo, man, them shoes ain't, ain't the business here. You know, like they had like, I don't know if it was like, I, I don't know, I forgot what the brand was. He had some of these CK or BK. I don't know if they were British yeah, Knights yeah. or something like that, but back in the day. Back in the day, the British Knights. Oh, well, I haven't heard yeah. about that brand in yeah, a while. I think, I think, because I went to school in a neighborhood that actually I wasn't living in. Yeah. So I was going to a school that was on the opposite side. So um, I told him, I was like, yo, that's, yeah, that ain't the business here. And he was just kind of like laughed it off, you know what I'm saying? And uh, so when we got out to school, we, we went opposite directions. So I walked one way, he walked the other. And as I was hitting the corner, I seen this car, you know, and it had a it had a bunch of dudes in the car. And, you know, I could tell when some, you know, when people were looking for trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, even at that age, I knew, you know, because they, they was looking at me and they was kind of mad dogging me and stuff. So, I, you know, I ain't going to lie, I was scared. Yeah, of course. You know what I'm saying? So I was just kind of like, you know, a part of me kind of almost froze up. Like, oh, shit. You know, I'm thinking they about to jump out and do something to me. So I'm like, oh, damn. You know, um, and of course, I wasn't looking for no problems at that time. Being light skinned, I am, and just the whole racial thing, I was dealing with enough. Exactly. So, uh, so anyways, but they kept going. They kept going. They kept going, but they were still kind of, they weren't speeding. They were still kind of, looked like they were looking for somebody. Yeah. So, as they was doing that, of course, I'm kind of like, 
you know, looking, looking to see, to see which happening. way they go. Yeah, and uh, they pulled up on uh, on my homeboy, on my friend, and uh, I didn't. I, I they they were saying something to each other. I, I didn't hear it. Yeah. Um, all I saw was a gun pull out, and they done they, him right they, there. Yeah, they laid him down. Wow. You know what I'm saying. Um, and that was at so, 10, and, 11 years old. Yeah, and the, and the dude looked at me, and, you know, he kind of gave me that look, like, yo, don't say shit. Like, I knew what that look, man. He was like, yo, I mean, you, 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 we'll come back. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, you know, and I ran over there, and he was. He bled out? Yeah, he was kind of just looking in the space. He was kind of seeing through me, I guess, you know. And that was the end. Yeah. And at that time, because I know you say you saw one at four, but at that yeah. time at 11, how many have you seen between four and 11? That was the first, well, that particular instance was the first time where I was like, oh, looking the at person. part of it and knew it. And, and knew that, that he was dying in front of me. You know what I'm saying? Um, before that, I had kind of seen the aftermaths of it. Like I would hear it all the time too at nighttime, you know, especially at that time, every night it was, you know, every single, you hear the drum roll. Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm saying? And yeah. I knew the difference between like automatic weapons and semi-automatic yeah, weapons. Yeah. And I could tell you what kind of gun was shooting. You know, these are super young ages. You know what so, just came to mind, yeah. and um, I don't know why I never thought about it before, but where gangs are concerned, you see a lot of people have seen people die. Mm -hmm. and um, But then when you think about the military, who have seen people die and they come back and they have all this PTSD and all of this trauma because of it. Yeah. But you don't ever hear gang members talking about PTSD. It's like, you have to be too hard, but mentally, I know it messes you up. Oh, we suffer from it too. Well, well uh, in America, they don't recognize complex PTSD, which is what it's called in the world. Uh, if you, the, the, They have a manual basically that's, uh, that they use in the rest of the world that has basically diagnoses of things. You know, um, in here in America, we use the, the DSM, which is the book that they use to diagnose things. In that DSM, they have uh, what's called PTSD, mm -hmm. right? Now, PTSD is mostly thought of in the acute sense, meaning like, okay, you go to war or you in an accident or some kind of incident happens and then you suffering from that. All right. The difference between the PTSD that we go through is that it's lifelong. So that's why they call it complex PTSD. Okay. But it's not recognized in the DSM yet, which is why you know I talk a lot about it because mm -hmm. a lot of kids who, let's say you got some kids that are quote unquote misbehaving at school mm -hmm. and these different things, what happens a lot of times they'll go see these psychologists or these therapists that don't know the culture, they don't know what we're dealing with, so they'll be quick to give them a diagnosis of, of, of something that's gonna stigmatize them for the rest of their life, like they just misbehaving. You know, like they got conduct disorder mm -hmm. or you know, oppositional defiant disorder, which is like, oh, these kids are just criminals, basically. They right. just like being bad and they gonna break the law. They don't understand that most of those things are symptoms of PTSD that's not getting addressed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so they're messing up these kids' lives with these misdiagnoses yeah. because those diagnoses stay on your record for the rest of your life. Mm. You get know what I'm saying? So that they label these kids when they're not even really treating the thing. And you know, that's that's why we, some of these know. kids don't want or parents don't want the kids to go because they know it's gonna stay on their record. Yeah. And a lot of Black parents don't want any rec anything on any of their children's record because they're going to be labeled. Well, they they also paranoid of a system that's built against them. Exactly. And that's another uh, hurdle that I come in that I come to you know to have to come against when I'm trying to treat people is you know the trust is not there. So when people see me, they're like, oh, he's one of us. Yeah. Okay. So they more willing to kind of like open up because I done been through what they've been through, you know, and I understand. You feel me? And but not many therapists are like that because when you seek out a therapist or kids just go to a therapist like at school, yeah. most of these people don't understand even when you tell them what is going on at home or what they've been through, they cannot understand because they've never been there. They can't fathom it. Yeah, they don't know the culture. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, again, there's a lot of therapists and psychologists out there that try. You know what I mean? They, they try. But there's just no way if you're not in it and you ain't seen it and you ain't experienced it, you're not going to have that perspective. I've been behind the bars. You know what I mean? I, I've, I've, I've been a, a victim and a perpetrator of these things. You get what I'm saying? So I, I get it from both angles, you know, and, and so I look at it and I was like, well, what can I do with this experience? What can I do with these experiences? And I feel like God just blessed me to say, hey, you know what? You're still alive. 
go help somebody with those experiences. So how old were you when that was enlightened to you? Uh, I mean, I always knew at a young age that, you know, that I had a purpose. I just didn't really know what it was. What it was. Yeah. Um, I always knew I wanted to kind of reach people. You know what I mean? Uh, but, I mean, I was, I, I think, I would say in my mid-20s probably, or close to my mid-20s, where I was like, you know, I had just, uh, I was being investigated for a murder that I didn't commit, that I didn't do. So I, I had to go sit down for a minute, you know, and fight that case. And Did uh, you win? Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. I did. I really didn't do it. Mm -hmm. But they you know, put trumped up charges on people all the time. All the time. So you know, and I've never been the type to tell. You know, so they were basically, you know, like, well, if you don't give us information about this, right. this, and that, you're not gonna see the light of day. And I knew that they had it in their power to try to frame me or do whatever they was gonna do. You know, because the things that they did have were like, oh yeah, this could be him. But they, I just wasn't really there. I didn't do it. So mm -hmm. that's why, I, you know, I was like, nah, yeah. Do what you're going to do. I'm not going to tell. I'm not going to snitch anyway. If y'all going to give me the time, to just take me back to myself because I'm not saying nothing. Mm -hmm. And I just prayed on it. And um, I came to a realization when I was locked up because I eventually got bailed out. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but while I was in there, you know, I was and I did all my time in the county. So it was turned up. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But, I, you know, I, after a little while in there, I came to some kind of moment of clarity where I was like well God wants me to learn something here so I actually that night prayed and I said you know what thank you for this experience mm -hmm. like I thanked him for being in jail because mm -hmm. clearly I felt like this is something I'm supposed to I'm supposed to be here and when I and it's crazy because when I started looking at it like that everything started to go in my favor as far as like the case I got bailed out you know what I'm saying and uh yeah, and then and then I, from that moment, I had, you know, I had a purpose. I was like, man, I need to change up some things. Plus, I had I was a new dad at that time. Um, I had just had both of my kids, mm -hmm. and um, I finally had something to live for. Because before that, I didn't care if I lived or died. Right. I really didn't care about it because it was just me. Mm -hmm. But now my kids, I was like, damn, I gotta be here. Because I always told myself if I had kids, I wouldn't go and do like what my pops did. I mm -hmm. wasn't finna just bounce. So you know. And shouts out to my pops. You know, I, I try not to judge him for that, but it's just reality. You know what right. I'm saying? Uh, he gave I, you I didn't want to do that. He know? gave you a why. Yeah. That, that's the good thing about it because a lot of times some people don't even ever figure it out. At least you figured it out. Yeah. So, you know what yeah. I mean? And I, so I just, I just took my ass to school. You know, I took one class and I was like, yo, if I could pass this class, I'm going to take a full load as far as like scheduling. How long know? does it take? Uh... Well, if you're trying to do what I'm doing. Yeah. How many years? I mean, some people go to just to get their master's, which is probably about six years. You know, I'm I'm a doctoral candidate. Okay. So uh, that takes about a decade. I've been in school about a decade, so I'm finishing up my doctorate. You know okay, what I mean? Okay, that's cool. So I've been in school for about 10 years. Uh, mm -hmm. Strong. But going back to where you live in Compton, being light-skinned as you are, Yeah. I can imagine how much prejudice you were under oh absolutely i faced it from everybody whether they was my own people or or they was white folks or mm -hmm. they was mexican it's like you don't belong nowhere yeah i didn't really belong nowhere you know uh, obviously when people talk to me and they was around me for a while they all oh, he's black mm -hmm. you know but i'm spanish too though <laughs> you know what i'm saying and i'm native american you feel me so you know, it was just always, a, I was always fighting. That's Did they I, ever I'm, try to make you choose? Like, like you yeah. can't be, you can't be Absolutely. all of this all at once. You gotta be either over here or over there. Absolutely. Yeah. What did you do? I eventually chose up. I mean, you know, it is what it is, especially in jail, you gotta, mm -hmm. you gotta choose up. You know what I mean? And I chose up, you know, and, and you know, no disrespect to any other culture or whatever it was, right. but that's just why I came up. You know, I came up around what I came up around, so I made my decision, you know okay. what I mean? But. Um, yeah. Let me ask you something. I, I see Pac on your Instagram, and I know you got a history with Pac. Just give us a little rundown on, like, how you even met Tupac, you know? I first, who man, I first met Tupac, uh, I think I like a, he was at a school, uh, he was speaking at a school. Uh-huh. And uh, at the time, I was like, you know, I was, I was really in it. Like, him and Ice Cube were, like, my favorites. Okay. And, uh 
I was like, oh man, he gonna be at this school. I forgot what school it was. I don't know if it was like manual or some one of these. He was like how 13, 14? I was younger than that. 12, oh, t- I was 11? probably like 12, 11, something like that. Um, so uh, I remember leaving school with one of my older homies and uh, we went over there and he was speaking to the school, you know, and he kind of walked off stage. And of course, ding, on the light of <laughs> thing light in there, you know what I mean? And he was like, you know, hey, what's up? You know, and he actually talked to me for a little bit. Wow. You know, um, so that was, you know, and then I just kept running into him. You know what I mean? Because, you know, I've been on my own. I've been in these streets for a long time, yeah. bro. Uh, I caught my first case at 12 years old. Wow. wow. So, you know what I'm saying? So, I, you know, I've been out here putting it work for a long time. Yeah. Um, so I was always around people that was older than me. And um, at that time, I was getting the chance to meet a lot of rappers because, uh, you know, shouts out to my, uh, to my big bro, uh, Kenny McLeod. Uh, Kenny McLeod owned the Black Hole Studios back in the days. And um, who were some of the rappers? Easy E. Oh, you met Easy? Yeah, I met Easy. Uh, 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 I, one of the first rappers I met was Easy. Uh, Quick, Bone Thugs, and Harmony. Yeah. Uh, everybody that has something to do with like Ruthless because they was always recording. It was the always Black Hole. Recording. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I met. Uh, I had my first exposure with the Bay Area because of that. Uh, the homie CNH, okay, uh, that was managing the Loonies at the time. Yeah, yeah, met some. Yeah, of I met guys. him. I met uh, Drew Down. Drew Down. Yeah, Man. Uh, and this was when it was popping. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Mac yeah. of the year was out. Oh you know yeah, them boys was so, Like yeah, it was like he was popping at that time, and uh, so, you know, Kenny helped let me hang out. You know what I'm saying? I, you know, because one day I just knocked on the door one day. And I was just like, yo, I heard it's a recording studio. How old was you? How old was you? Oh, no, I was younger than 10. At oh, that yeah, time. you just over there messing with him. I was just riding around in the bikes, and, and uh, one of my older homies had told me, like, yeah, you know, it's a They do music studio. over there. It was on Rosecrans, so it was like right in the area. So um, I just knocked on the door. I was just like, yo, man, I got $50, and, you know, I'm trying to record. He just kind of laughed at me and was like, man, you know how much it calls me up in here? I was just like, yeah. I, I mean, I got 50 bucks, you know? He, and so he knew, he, you know, because we used to see them all the time, so he was like, oh, man, this one of the kids from the yeah, area. You from know the area. So he would let me hang out, you know what I'm saying, and chill and be in the big recording studios and, you know. So did you ever that. see Pac in the studio? Um, yeah, a couple times. A couple times. A couple times, yeah. Most of the times when I ran into him, though, it was just like, at like, it's crazy. I used to see him at, like, house parties. Yeah. Like, in the hood. He you always know, come to the yeah, hood. Yeah, yeah. He knew a lot of people that I knew that was around, so I was just always kind of intermingling, you know, and, and, you know, when you see, like, hey, man, you know, I, I'm easy to remember, you yeah. feel me? So, especially at that time, I had long hair. I was yeah. looking like one of the bone thugs, <laughs> I don't remember. So, uh, you know, like, hey, what's up? Woo, whoop. And then as the years went on, I got cool with his family, you know, uh, and then even after he passed, I got, you know, super close with the family, too, you know, so. I want to ask you about you that, know. like, like yeah. when, when he was going, when that whole uh, beef thing was going on out here, you was, you was older then. Well, how was you during that time? I wasn't old enough to drive. You weren't old enough to drive, nah. but you was in the street. But you I knew was, what was, was going around. on. Yeah, I knew what was happening. Did you, and, and so the time when he, when he got killed and all that, and being that you was a big fan of his, how did that affect you? Because I look at all of these things, because I know, I was affected to a point, you know, to where I'm same age, born a month apart. You yeah. you think about all these things, but you really knew him. Right. So what did you think around that time? I mean, I was hurt, first of all. I mean, and it shocked me because at that time, I didn't think that somebody so big could be touched. Yeah. You know, uh, which is, I guess, naive of me to being, you know, that young. I, I felt like, damn, you a mega celebrity. That shouldn't happen, you yeah. know, or that can't happen. Like I don't know why I thought that that can't happen. Yeah, you know what I mean. I know there's been other rappers before that. Like you know, when I got older, I heard stories about like Scott Rock and people like that. But I, I wasn't in, that was before my time, so I wasn't listening to rap music at that yeah. time. You know what I'm saying? Um, so Tupac was the first person where I was like, damn, he could be on top of the world and. Get killed, you that. know, and because they have all that yeah. bodyguards, so you think that oh yeah, they protect it. Yeah, or just not even that. When you a little kid and you looking up at that, you just you like oh you made it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, There's nobody gonna touch him. Like who gonna touch? You know what I mean? I, I, I don't know. And, and then he had got shot before, and he pulled through. I mean, Tupac was like Superman to me. Yeah, no, you know what I'm right. saying I, I, even that week that he was shot. You know, we all thought he was gonna make it. Yeah, of course, you everybody was thinking yeah. that. And it, the, even the doctors were like, "Oh, he doing better." Yeah, they you know, played us. I, yeah, and, and 
damn, it just happened. And I remember uh, Theo was on the radio at that time on 92.3 to beat. And I knew Theo too, because uh, I used to call into the radio station every day. Uh, and uh, he used to talk to me every day. And I, so I heard him on the radio. And um, I just, you know, a tear came to my eye, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I just remember him playing Stevie Wonder, Ribbon in the Sky. Yeah. So whenever that so whenever that song come on, I think it's too yeah. What about, was it, do you feel like it was our Orlando pe person that they always say? I knew, I knew who did it. You I, knew exactly I mean, who it was. Because of the, being a part of, you in Cali. Yeah. You in the streets all the time. Right. So it was obvious to you, you, you might have knew what was going on a little more than the yeah. person in Texas. Right. I knew what was kind of happening behind the scenes. I mean, I knew a lot of people that were actively in that. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, so I knew I knew some of the little beefs that were going on, some of the rumors and some of the things that were happening in the street. So, yeah. I mean, it wasn't long before I knew what, what, what happened. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Uh, as far as the legality aspects of it. You know, yeah, but it, people try to turn to conspiracy and all kind of stuff, but you being more tapped in would be here. Be like if something happened in Texas in my hood, I'm gonna know, okay, nah, that ain't what it was. This is what it was. Well, this is the thing. It's like, I think we talked about this off camera a little yeah. bit. Um, this is the thing, this is what's wrong with us as people, you know, and, and what's messed up about us killing each other the way we do is that it can be anything. You know what I'm saying? So could it have been a big conspiracy? Yeah. Could it have been over nothing? Yeah. But that's the problem. It could be everything. Yeah, so when, whenever it could be any of that. Any so, of that. so when you have somebody important like that, that's a voice for a generation. You know, and we gotta have remember. You know, we gotta show some compassion to Tupac. He's very young. You know, he was a baby. Twenty four, twenty five. Yeah, when he died. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So he was a baby. You know, in the grand scheme of life. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And um, you know, he was very intelligent for his age, but he was lacking some 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 life experience. Just just because why being wise doesn't come from being smart. Yeah. Being wise comes from age and experience and things. So, you know, I think he just was a victim of his youth at that at that point, but to bring it 360 to what we saying, the problem with us killing each other so often is that when you have somebody important like that, if it is a conspiracy, they can make it look like it's not because we do kill each other, each other over nothing. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You get socked out, somebody get beat up, that's a reason to get killed. If you talk shit about somebody, that's a reason to get killed. If you step on somebody's shoe, that's a reason to get killed. If you're wearing the wrong shit, that's a reason to get killed. You know, uh, it's a song that I included on my dissertation by Kendrick Lamar. Shout out to Kendrick. That's the that's that's my little bro. Yeah, you know what I'm saying yeah, that's, um, that's neighborhood as well, right? That's the homie. Yeah, I, I've known Kendrick for a long. Time. Everybody at TDE actually from top all the way down. You know what I'm saying? Uh, shouts out to TDE. That's family. But Kendrick got a song called Fear, which I feel is one of the best songs ever made. Wow. As far as, yeah, because on the second verse, he talk about all the different ways there is to die as a black man coming out the hood. The first part of my dissertation was based on that, mm -hmm. that I did for my doctorate degree. You know what I'm saying? And the reason why I felt like that song was such a, a genius song is because again, he listed like all the different ways that you can die. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Just walking home from a house party, being somewhere you're not supposed to be at, somebody you beat up years ago that you done forgot about. Come right back around. Come back around, you know, like, and that's what's wrong with us, and that's why we so easy to break up. That's why our movements are so easy to break up, because the, the oppressors, the people that don't want to see us rise, can always use the same blueprints that they used with a Martin Luther King, that they used with a Malcolm X, that they used with anybody else. You know what I'm saying? They, they'll use us to set us up. How can we change all of this? How can it, how can it change? Through this mental process. This is why I got into mental health, because I personally, you know, shouts out to all the movements, you know, the Civil Rights Movement, the Black Panthers, you know, uh, uh, you know the Spanish brothers that are in this, you know, being Afro-Latino, I gotta shout them out too. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? People like the Young Lords who are the Puerto Rican parts of the Black Panthers. We have to get our minds right before those movements could work. Right. Because if we don't get our minds right, and getting our minds right means dealing with our own trauma, dealing with ourselves, 
being able to police ourselves, you know what I'm saying, to, to, to have some kind of order mm-hmm. going around. You know, this is what Tupac was working on with the Code of Thug Life, you know, having rules to even the gang shit. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying, to have some kind of morals with it. You and know. being comfortable, because what I look at is being comfortable being led by somebody else. Because you have a group of people and you could be the person who is the most outspoken one in the group, but then be somebody below you who be like, why he get to be the, the yeah. one who's, and start some problems and that's how people also get killed. That's the slave mentality. You know, that's, that's part of our trauma. That's part of our generational trauma. That's Willie Lynch. They mm-hmm. made it like that on purpose. They made us hate each other. The whole colorism thing. Why, why, why is there a division between us, light and black? Why? They did that on purpose. Do you the believe, house nigga in the field nigga. Like, that's what that was for. Do you believe that we're still suffering mentally from all the trauma that slaves Absolutely. passed? Absolutely. Has passed down? Absolutely. To this day. It's a big, because that's, it's a that, big deal, right? That's been the most consistent thing that we've passed down. Why, do, why these white folks have been, you know, passing down uh, uh, financial literacy, Mm-hmm. been passing down how to make it credit all these different things we've been passing down trauma after trauma after trauma slavery wasn't that long ago you know so I get offended when people are like yo just get over it it's been so it's been this whatever it's been like okay you got grandparents great grandparents that could tell you about slavery right now that's still alive that's not that long ago so hell yeah we still uh <laughs> Suffering, suffering behind. Suffering but then when you look at the Bible days, though, you had the, the Egyptians, you had all of those other people. You know, when Moses went and said, let my mm-hmm. people go, they weren't being enslaved even as far as back then. Yeah. So when you think about that, is that being passed down from way back then? I think any traumatic experience like that, that's, that's very traumatizing to a whole group of people. You know, genocide, things like that, is always going to be traumatic for years and years and years and years. You're going to feel the effects of that for a long time. But how many years? Like, how long before it just... It's going to keep going. That's the genius behind this machine that they've set in place. And I respect it. I respect it because... And I'm going to tell you like this. (laughs) They were smart. They were smart. And to to be able to break that down, you have to know it. You got to know how it happened. You know what I mean? You got to know the intricacies that's involved with it. The mental play, everything that was happening. It wasn't just whips and chains. No. He was, found a it book was, about it. Yeah, it was mental trauma that came from that. Separating families, you know, you know, not even, it, it, even, not even as long ago as the slave uh, trade. You could look down to the 60s and 70s when they eliminated trades. During the 50s and 60s and even in the 30s, you know, you had like... Uh, over there like in Harlem, and even here on Main Street, out here in LA, you had blacks that was thriving because we had trades. People knew how to do stuff. You can give me, you can make enough to go buy a house and go buy some land and do something. You know, recently, they took those away. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, we don't got no, okay, go to college and learn what? Yeah, I always had issues with that. You, you know, know, and I'm not against college. I went I'm not to college. Against, I'm not against it either, but I'm just saying it makes sense for some, some it doesn't. Some, yeah. it's just, it's, it's a hit and miss. Yeah, and, and, and the thing is, is like, the trauma is so diverse in how they've hit us mm-hmm. over, these, over this time that it's so crazy. The genius of what they did is that they didn't have to be alive for it to keep going. Mm-hmm. And you, you, you know, know what I'm saying? We're doing it ourselves, ourselves now. You get what I'm saying? And this is why we have to reverse that. And we the only to. way that we can do that is to sit with ourselves mentally. This is the problem. We so concerned, and rightfully so, we concerned with living day to day. Surviving. Surviving and living is not the same. Mm-hmm. You get what I'm saying? So if we're busy just surviving every day, how are we going to find the time to heal the past trauma that's still affecting us, that's affecting your DNA, my DNA, your DNA, the, our brains, you know? This trauma affects how you think, how you learn, you know, your blood pressure. You know what I'm saying? You mm-hmm. combine all that together, you got black folks dropping dead at 50 years old. Heart attack. Why? Yeah. I, I, I sat back and watched, like I said, all the 
they they put it all in a big pot like when you look at the gang violence and you look at the trauma and you look at just the the separated homes whether you was in a gang or not in LA you still got separated homes that's yeah. a portion of it as yeah. well you just spoke on it earlier Absolutely. like all of these things these factors come together and voila you see all the things happening in our neighborhoods you know um you know, and then you see all the prospering things that's happening yeah. in the good white folks neighborhood because these white folks didn't have that situation. You go over there to uh, Grove Mall, is it Groove Grove Mall? That mall I was at, Where's Grove it? or is it Grove? Where's that mall at? Grove, I think. Where it's are? over by Beverly Hills. Oh, Miracle Mall. Yeah, that one. By La Brea Tarkers. That's right, yeah. yeah the yeah. good mall. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? <laughs> he said the good mall. The good yeah. mall, where the good people at. Where yeah. I, I walk through there, I'm like, wow. You know, you can tell that they, they're in a better place. You know, I'm being real. Like, yeah, when nah, you look at sure. it, they don't have to think about some of the things that you had to experience. They, don't, they didn't have to go through that, even in other cities. In each city, in each state, you can go to those places and see those good, pristine people in those situations you know a few brothers and a few hispanics may make it into that area but it's few and far between yeah and <laughs> you know and that's that's what we got to change you know um you know there's a lot of things that we got to change about you know our existence you know mentally financially you know that's why i was such a fan of what nick was doing rest in peace you know uh you know the financial literary, literacy aspect of what he was doing you know that's a part of this yeah you know what i mean and being able to rise and own your shit and you know excuse my language on your no, own that's land real. and uh you know how did because you knew nip like yeah. Yeah, i met nipsey um yeah. how was your experience with just nipsey because you knew him and you guys yeah. had, did you y'all hung out and y'all was in the, you was over there off slawson sometime I, was, I, I mean i used to be on crunch on slawson every day so let's talk about it like yeah. like like how did you end up meeting uh nipsey I was running with some folks, uh, you know, shout out to my Jamaican partners, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I was running with some folks that was, you know, we were strong in the game at that time. You know, um, can't speak too much about it. It's still a lot, some people serving but it's time like behind that. You, but you, how did you end up over there? Like, I'm, that's not the area yeah, that you should even be in. Yeah, yeah, no, well, the thing is, is that we owned a, a store over there. Okay. My folks owned a, a music store called Westworld Music. And okay. And it was in that same, uh, uh, parking so, the same it was strip. right next door to his store really before it was his store though before it was his store and next door to his store when it was there because I went over there uh, yeah. it, it seemed like they was buying the whole thing yeah, up no, they did they did they did buy the whole thing up and and we was we, like I said if, if okay so if you got the the marathon store that was like right here correct I'm facing the marathon All right we was right there and Y'all was right corner, there in that little, in that corner, little corner, right corner. Yeah, I know right exactly up. where you it's was. It's a fish. It was a, then after I us. I thought it was, it was a cleaner a, somewhere right there too. Yeah. Well, after us, it was like a fish market, and then you had like the haircut place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was still there at that time too. So I, when me and Nipsey net met, we were still kids. It was in the nineties. Yeah. Late nineties. Um, and the first thing I noticed about is how smart he was. You know, he yeah. was out there hustling like I was hustling. You know, and uh, from then on, we just again kind of like the whole pot thing we just kept seeing each other because we was both in the street yeah and then we both went into the music shit yeah 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 so we was just always just running into each other i mean i remember you know even i, I got out the county on some case i was fighting uh um and he did too the same day <laughs> so we walked out of the court building together yeah you know what i said so we was just you know I, we seen each other kind of grow up you know yeah what I'm that's dope and, and um he was a very smart we always had real conversations you know, uh, above just about gang shit, like really about like what we was trying to do in business, yeah, and stuff like that. So he's always been a genius. Wow, you know, I noticed that in him. So very early. did you ever get to meet Lauren? Uh, you know what? I think I, I probably just like shook her hand. Probably okay. I've never actually like met her like yeah. that. Um, I was cool with Nip. That's and dope. His, and his bro. That's dope. Sam and Black his Sam. Pops. And his pops. I met yeah, all those, those guys. The, the, them was the ones that I really like. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, I got a relationship with some of his homies. You know what I mean? But again, I'm not from that Correct. area. So really, me and Nip had to. Well, let me ask you this: when, when the day when you found out that that uh, he was killed in front of the store, because I remember that day. Um, certain things you just never forget. That was the thing that was more publicized. It was on TV. Like yeah. you could see it. The internet take things and they spin them and do whatever. Like where were you at that day and kind of run down through there on, on your thoughts on everything that would transpire? I was in the car with my son. I was taking him to go train for football uh, to a park, and my cousin Roscoe called me. My cousin that's here, um, and uh, 
he was there. He was over there when it happened. Oh, really? Yeah, so he knew the whole, like, get down. And uh, he called me and was like, yo, this nigga Nip is lying dead. I, like, I could see him. Wow. And I was just like, I thought he was, pl I, I told him, I said, man, stop playing, bro. Yeah. Like, cuz, seriously, stop, stop it. He was like, nah, like, it's real. You know, because I had heard rumors before. Like, oh, somebody dead. Oh, somebody dead. He's like, mm -hmm, whatever. You just, it's a bunch yeah. of bullshit. You know what I'm saying? But he was like, nah, this is real. And I was, you know, I sent my son to the field. My son heard the phone call, too. My son knew Nip. He been to the store. He knew Sam. Yeah. You know? And uh, we just kind of sat there for a second. like, And, you know, I sent him to the field, and I just was, you know, I was on my phone just trying to look up anything I could, you know, to find out if this was real, you know, and it was. And uh, you still didn't want to believe it. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, that was a that was a that was a hell of a miss. I mean, with with all the things he was trying to do, um, you know, where he was headed with it for um, that to happen. And then then for it to happen the way it did, man, it's just something that you 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 never would have thought that that would have happened that way. That's the problem. We never would have thought it. You we never said, would have thought it would have happened that way. And that's the thing. Like, we got to start being aware of, of of what's around us. You know what I mean? We got to. We have to. You know, uh, we too good at killing our greats. We we real good at it. Like, yeah. It, it, like I could. The list can go on and on. Yeah. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, and people are yeah. getting more and more bold Man. because even like in Dallas when Mo three got killed and he got killed right on the highway that's yeah. something that never happened I, see, I mean yeah. all the traffic and everything yeah. they didn't care I they had a mission there. yeah yeah. They're in front of every I saw the pictures of it and it was like I was like damn that's like hopping out on a 405 and yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. that's exactly what but it was yeah I, yeah that was crazy yeah, you know, that's the same to him thing. Too. Rest in peace. Yeah. Rest in peace. So you, you got to speak with Mo3? Nah, I know a lot of people that knew him. Knew him, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I never had the chance to meet him. Yeah. But very yeah. talented, brother. Yeah, very talented. Um, so when you look at uh, just uh, getting back to Nip a little bit, you know, being that entrepreneur spirit, man, I heard that they had hope, opened the spot back up, but it's not in the same location? Yeah, they have a new store. Yeah. I know, um, I don't want to give people the wrong location. I think it's on Melrose or something yeah. like that. But um, I know he also, they also got the dispensary in the Valley. Yeah, it's still popping. Yeah, I went over there um, uh, to celebrate with them. I seen Sam. You uh, did? Lauren was there. I seen Lauren okay. there actually that day. Okay. Um, yeah. So I seen her there and I seen the sister there. The whole family was there. I, um, Pops, you know, uh, yeah, shout out uh, to my homeboy George. He, work, he, he works for them still. Um, and uh, yeah. Did any more music come out uh, after he had passed? Uh, I've heard songs here and there. But I don't nothing, know. no I don't project. Know. Yeah, I don't know how much he had left. I'm yeah. not sure. Uh, I'm hoping he has some, you know, a bunch of a bunch of stuff. He was always working. Well, I know he got some. Shout out to Mr. Lee. I know for a fact he got that because uh, he was talking about another Blue Laces. You know, he out of he out of Texas. Oh yeah, and you know the sad thing about that is the same sad thing with Tupac too. Is like. If you listen to their music at that time that they passed, they was made turning a corner. Yeah, yeah. Like, like you was seeing where they was going. Yeah. You know, like Pac, like almost like Pac came in on some revolutionary shit, and then you could see he went right to back to it. Yeah. Like yeah. If you listen to the Machiavelli album, it was like the perfect mix of the commercial and the revolutionary things. Like he found himself. Like yeah. okay, yeah, this is this, this is, is what, what I, I want to be. Well, that's what I want to be. And look how young and he was again, did. like you said earlier. And and Nip, same thing. Like. You listen to Nip's music right before he passed, you see what he was on. Yeah. Like, uh, you see he had, like, turned that corner. Yeah. Where he, like, kind of found himself artistically. Mm -hmm. and, and he made the art match what was inside of his soul. Yeah. I feel like he found that, like, perfect balance. Yeah. And so it was very sad to see that, you know, and happen at that time. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's something else. Like I said, no matter how you try to paint the picture, it's still, you know, brothers killing brothers, man. Yeah. It's still... Um, it's still self-inflicted a lot of times. It's no trauma. matter, how, you trauma. know, it's trauma. And, it's the, and, and and you know, you uh, being one that, uh, you know, now you you know you got a thing where you able to speak to these guys. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I think that's the dope part about it. That that's the whole setup of why we do what we do is to be able to communicate with our people in a way to where we can help uh, snatch them out the fire. That's the only way to do it. You know, and we all links in a chain. You know, I'm not, I'm not doing this to see the change myself. 
Right. I know that the reason why I'm doing this, I'm not going to see it. I'm right. not going to live to see it. And, and that's because it took us a long time to get into this. It's going to take us a little bit of time to get out. But you so, can't do it by no. yourself. It's going to take a lot more people like you yeah. to keep doing it and do it in other places to try to minimize all of that, you know, damage that was placed upon us. Exactly. You know, and, and that takes time. Mm -hmm. You know, it takes time for those people to come together and it takes time for that movement to, to hit on a macro level. You know what I mean? On a major level. Because, level. again, look at all the years it took to get us like, like this. It's gonna take us some time to get talk, out. So. Let's talk a little bit about healing as gangster. Like, yeah. let's that's talk your about, program, right? Yeah, let's talk yeah. about the, um, you know, I, I, that. I know Dame was on that series, the episode one, I guess. Yeah, uh, well, Dame helped me develop it. So let's talk about how you and him even got to know each other. You know, oh, let, let's be, so. let's let's get to the nitty gritty. You know what I mean? Like, how did you end up meeting Dame Dash? Dame is from Harlem. Yeah. You know, he's not from out here. You know, right. and and but he came out here, and I remember he was out here because I always been a big fan of. He was out here for like ten years. Correct. I've been yeah. a big fan of his. Like, I was like, man, this dude right here, because I felt like. We've been in those rooms where he, I felt like he stood for his people. I remember seeing him on a panel where Andy Hilfiger and Carl Kanai was at Magic, and he just pretty much, once he get, gets to talking, yeah, it's he, like he, he yeah. like, uh, like he there for me. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the things he's saying is, is really hidden on, on points to where I feel good about being who I am to see a brother up there handling himself in that way. So okay. just give me a little bit of spiel on how you and him linked up. Uh, well, you know, I had seen him in passing, just kind of being in the game. But I actually had really, really met him through uh, my homegirl, uh, Brianna. Brianna was on Growing Up Hip Hop. Um, some of y'all that watch that show yeah, might yeah. know who she is. Uh, me and her kind of came up together. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people would see Brianna and they were like, oh, yeah, you know, Mary J. Blige, stepdaughter, blah, 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 industry this. She come from the hood. <laughs> okay? She done, we done hustled together, all that. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So, uh you know, kind of growing up like that, you know, she knew what was going on with me. Um, she knew I was in school and she knew what I was doing. So she would call me a lot of times to ask me things, you know, if she was going through something, you know, I'll try to help her. You know, we yeah. help each other. Of course. You know what I'm saying? Um, and a lot of stuff. So she's solid, super solid. Shouts out to her. But um, one day I was driving home from uh, dropping my son off and um, she had called me and uh, she was telling me about a situation with, uh, with Boogie. Which okay. was Dame's son. Yeah, Bug. yeah, definitely. Yeah. I know, but and um, you know, he was having, you know, he was having some trouble at that time, dealing with some issues. And uh, you know, she was asking me about, you know, my input on it. You know, of how course. to deal with it because she knew I was, I could come from a clinical perspective. And uh, so we had a long conversation about it on the phone. And she was like, you know what, you need to come help me. And I was like, okay. And she was like, nah, for, nah, I'm, we're going to bring you on. So I'm, I want you to meet Dane. And I was like, for sure. And she hit me. She was like, yo, you want to do the show? And I'm like, yeah, I want to do the show for sure. I mean, that's the plan I had anyway. Anyway. The whole time I've been in school, I always knew I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this to TV because I knew there was nobody like me. There's nobody that's from the hood that did this. Correct. That's a psychologist. It's not. You're not going to see it. Well, I hope you see it. But up until this point, <laughs> you, yes, you haven't seen it's, it's it like far between. Yeah. But right. you will be that so, inspiration to others once they see you on that exactly. TV that, you know what, I don't have to continue in this life. I can turn around. Because people be wondering, how can I give back? Yeah. How can I give back? They don't realize how they can give back. Or, but or I guess, again, how can I turn my life around? Or how can I turn yeah, my life I mean? around? Exactly. But, but what you need to also speak on is some people might not want to go to school for that 10 years. Yeah. But they still want to help people. Which can they? Can. they? Yeah, absolutely. I didn't need these degrees to do it. Okay. I just knew what my goal was, so I knew that the first thing that they was going to say was, he ain't got no degree. He ain't got no da-da-da. And they're going to try to shush me to the thug group. Oh, he just a gangster. He on whatever. I got the degrees. You can't tell me shit. <laughs> big big you know congrats on that. Yo, good looking out. So, you know, you know, so again, I always had that plan. Mm -hmm. I didn't think it was going to happen that soon. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, I was still getting, I was still uh, finishing up my master's degree at that point. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So I was really just starting to like get my clinical experience. You know right. what I mean? So she came, she was like, yo, I was like, hell yeah, I want to do the show. I was not ready. I was like, let's go. So uh, she told me the dates. I went, I met Dame. You know, I did the whole therapist thing. I dressed like a therapist. You dressed like a therapist? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
I dressed, you know, I had the whole little suit and all that. Yeah, because you know, I was, I didn't want to be perceived the wrong way. Of right. course, it's the first time I'm presenting myself Correct. to people on a major level. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I did the show. Um, yeah, I did like basically an intervention, you know, and they filmed it. I was on TV the whole week. Wow. So everybody seen it, and so it kind of took me up to another notch. Uh, me and Dame kind of stayed in touch sparingly. Mm-hmm. Um, we shared a lot of, of the same friends. One of my okay. best friends in this game is John Monopoly. Okay. Yeah, John Monopoly, for those who don't know, is has been the mastermind behind a lot of Chicago. He was a mastermind behind Kanye West. Okay. You know, uh, before Dame came and snatched him up. Okay. You know, uh, or put him on, I should say. Of Not course. snatched him up, because John Monopoly was there the whole time. Okay. So, uh, so he was a big friend that we both had in common. So uh, one day, Monopoly was here actually in this other room, right? Yeah, yeah. And just here, this is the Dame Dash studio where all that was being recorded. Uh, well, the TV show the wasn't t- recorded. The TV here, show, but, but Dame was doing a lot of his work here. His work, okay. Yeah, and before he, you know, me and him did a business venture. <laughs> of course. Now I'm. Now this is all yours. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's exactly. you now. Big right. dog in it. Yeah. And shouts out to Dame because Dame is the, definitely the one who gave me the opportunity. To yeah, do but that did he give you a good deal? It. Let's talk about. See, I go crazy a little bit. Like, did he do you right? I mean, yeah, he did me right. But okay, again, that's like, all I know, need to know. But you, but you know, it's business. You know what I'm saying? I know and business I, at I, the end I, of the day. Know, he was like, "Yo, this how much it costs." I said, <laughs> "I said, give me 20 minutes." Yeah, I got. You know, I did my thing, and I was. I called him back in 20 minutes. I, said, I got the money. Let's go. Already. Yeah, so that's congratulations. So, yeah, on good that, looking. Good looking. So. Um, he was here chilling with Dame and Monopoly called me and was like, yo, come come to the spot. You know, Dame is here. I want you know, let's kick it. So I came. And so now at this point, Dame just knew me as a therapist. Yeah. He didn't know all of my history. Okay. You know what I'm saying? He didn't really know all that. And so Monopoly is the one that broke it down. So I'm like, yo, this is a real street dude right here. Like, <laughs> you know, because me and Mono- Monopoly has seen me grow. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. whenever Monopoly needed something, I was there. Already. And, and whatever it was, you needed something in LA, I, if I can't get it to you, I know somebody that got Correct. it. Correct. You know what I'm saying? So and on any level. That's, that's dope. Was. That was my job at the time. You yeah, know what yeah. You're going to make it happen. Yeah. So, um, so he explained that to Dane. And so when Dane found that out, Dane was just like, yo, why you ain't tell me none of that? <laughs> you know, like we know all the same people and you certified out here, like you you are reputable out here. And I was just like, I didn't want to, I didn't want to scare you really. I didn't want to, yeah. you know, cause LA got a, you know, a stigma attached to it. You know, I'd be like, oh, he a LA dude. Yeah, don't like, tell him uh, what this dude got trailing him. He got yeah, a trail, this dude got a to, tail, man. Yeah, he gonna try to extort me or he gonna try to, you know, whatever, yeah. you feel me? And. Uh, so I didn't want it to be like that. I really was taking my profession seriously. You're trying to clean it up. And, uh, You're trying to be a better person. I dude. wanted to be taken seriously. Yeah. You know, for, you know I, I'm, a, I'm one of the best psychologists, therapists in the world. And I say that gracefully. I'm still learning. I'm still getting better at what I'm doing. I have a lot to learn, but I'm very confident in my skill set. And I take it very seriously. Yeah. So I wanted him to take me seriously as a clinician. Yeah. So that's why I didn't tell him. So How once, long now have you had your um, doctorate? Uh, well, I'm f- completing it now. Completing actually, it now. Okay. yeah, I, I, I finished all of my. I finished everything I had to do. Basically, what I'm doing now is I'm uh, putting in my like, you know, when doctors go to med school and mm-hmm. they got to do their residencies. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm doing. Okay. I'm basically doing my residency right now. You got to do a bunch of free shit, basically, <laughs> <laughs> which is, which is a blessing though because I've used a lot of that to help my community. There you right. go. There you know, it I'm is. To go to these schools in my neighborhoods and be able to really be with these kids and talk to them. Yeah. So. That's a blessing, you know what I'm saying? But, um, so, Dame, once Dame found out that, oh, damn, you from the street? Like, I'm from the street. Like, it was on. It was on from there, you know what I'm saying? And uh, we became business partners on some things. We thought of healing this gangster together. Yeah, healing this gangster, Yeah, he was like, you know. I like that. I think he said it. I think he might have said it when we was, like, having a conversation. Yeah, he said it. He was like, yeah, man, healing this gangster. Healing this gangster. And I was like, Ding, the, the light bulb went. I was like, we need to put that on the t shirt. And then he was like, no, nah, we need to make it a show. And I was like, oh, well, it's on. So we made it a show. Now we This is history. So well, where can everybody see the show? Uh, right now, you can catch season one and season two on YouTube. I just, nope. started, I just started the YouTube. Um, you can also go to Dame Dash Studios. Yeah. That's, that's Dame Dash's network, mm-hmm. um, which she has a lot of stuff on there, um, there and on Tubi. Yeah. Um, we did some stuff with Fox too, Fox Soul. 
um, has some stuff running. So, um, but right now you can go to the YouTube or Dang Dash Studios. It's gonna be coming on some bigger platforms. That's what I was trying to see. What's the end goal with it? Yeah, you want it? I'm in negotiations with that. I'm I'm having some talks now. I'm just trying to do as much as I can on my own. Um, You know, obviously, the more you do on your own, the more ownership you have of things. Exactly. So, um, I'm just really on that right now. Yeah. But you can catch season one and season two on YouTube or at Dame Dash Studios. Um, You can catch the clips like on Instagram and things like that. You know, it's a real show. We got men and women. Uh, from the community, you know what I mean that that know that are like me that know this life, and um, it gets deep, man. You know, it, it, you know people cry on my show, they laugh, you know they they realize things about themselves they've never thought about, um, you know, and, and more times than not they come out with a weight lifted off their shoulders. Yeah, that's you know because I want I want I want my folks to know this. People think that therapy is somebody sitting there and messing with your brain, you know, just giving you a bunch of advice or trying to reprogram your brain. It's not. When I'm in therapy with a client, it's me listening and them really just talking to themselves. Yeah. Because there's a lot of things going on, like with trauma, PTSD, these different things. A lot of these things are unconscious, but they're manifesting through the body. Mm -hmm. They're manifesting through your behavior. They're manifesting through how you deal with people. You know what I'm saying? Like the fact okay for a long time I couldn't sit with my back to a door that's me you just that's you, most that's, that's most, me that's most street cats yeah that's but we don't realize that sometimes until later or why that is you know why am I always turned up everywhere I go even if, it, if I'm in a safe environment I'm still ready to turn up that's right. a problem that's, that's called being hyper vigilant that speeds up your blood pressure your brain turns some of your parts of your brain turn off to where now you can't think long term to get out of these situations, we gotta think long term. But if your sympathetic nervous system is in overdrive all the time, and you're always running from the bear, so to speak, the parts of your brain that are in charge of long term thinking are turned off. So you're just, okay, how can I get away from this? How can I get away from that? You're not thinking about how these decisions are gonna affect you long term. So if that's the case, a lot of people who commit as long as it was not premeditated, but it was spur of the moment, mm-hmm. murder or any crime, they usually can get off because of mental... Well, there's a science behind that. Right. Because, when, <coughs> when, again, if you're experiencing trauma or you've gone through something crazy, mm-hmm. like your brain, just certain parts of your brain turn off. And this is the thing. When you got kids, we already getting a subpar education in the hood, right? Now, when you combine that with you're dealing with young brains that are not set to learn correctly... Because they're nervous about right. getting shot going home. Like yeah. me, I used to worry about dying walking home from school. How if I'm worried about that, I'm supposed to learn with this George Washington and... <laughs> but look how much has it, it's gotten worse yep. um, worldwide where a lot of people, um, kids are being shot up in school. School mm-hmm. shootings and All stuff that. like that. You have kids who, and when I think about it, kids are going back to school scared mm-hmm. because they don't know if that person's going to come in today and shoot up the school. That has a neuro- neurological reaction in your mind. And so, again, when you combine that generation after generation, you get what you got now. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, that's well, why I'm hard yeah, on this mental I, thing. I think, I, think, I think it's dope that you, you tapped into this. I think it's needed. I think people... Um, can get help through you the hood therapist man yeah. great name man uh yeah, we it. need it man we need it man gangster you know healing is gangster uh, uh i would definitely say man our people our children need that man you you're gonna be able to reach people that other people can't with the statement you just made uh there are other kids right now to this day going through whether it be bullying or or, or going you know walking home from school fearing gang violence and all type of different things or going home you know I, I remember being three and my mom shot at my dad with a 12 gauge shotgun or my dad basically was uh, uh, abusive toward yeah. the children or toward me when my mom and dad divorced I can remember things like uh, us being you know uh, me and my dad not speaking for years right. because we were having issues toward one another because of right. the way he was raised mm-hmm. so I understand all these things a lot of the things that get me through though that have gotten me through has been God Absolutely. reading the word of God mm-hmm. being able to uh, understand 
how to go from faith to faith, understanding right. how right. to let go of things. Because the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, that's for me. He's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. So it's a cleansing process for Absolutely. me. Absolutely. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. those are things that I've read and things that we pray about and meditate on because that's meditation. I was about to say that. Yeah. A lot of people don't, you know, a lot of people don't know that. Like when you're praying, it's meditation. You're meditating. That's exactly. the same thing as, as if, if you're breathing. If you're doing like a breathing yep. exercise or you're, you know, you're closing your eyes and you're just centering yourself. Yeah. That's what praying is. That, you know, that's why that's the path that God reaches you through. Correct. When, when you open things up. Therapy is not the enemy. No. You know what I'm saying? And, and, you know, I want my people to understand that. You know what I mean? Now, they have a reason to feel that way. I, you know, I understand why they would think you know, or be scared of these types of things. You get what I'm saying? Because like everything else, and especially in this country, hmm. even psychology was based on a racial ideology or wow. race, you know, racism. Mm -hmm. It wasn't built for us. But You know what I'm saying? Me, so me, I'm trying to redefine some of the things that I've learned from what they do, but, but uh, put it in a context that's good for us. Well, you, you would be able to understand that coming from a place where we came from. Yeah. You know, you understand the hood. Like, yeah. the, the, this other guy who might be sitting in that yeah. seat, he, he never been in the hood, and he's trying to counsel you. This is happening as well. Right. I want to say that there are good counselors, it, it, just like anything else. There are bad counselors. Mm -hmm. there, there, There's a yin and yang in everything. Absolutely. So th that's the part where it can get confusing as well. Mm -hmm. Because you got people out here who mean people... They, they just there for the money yeah. or they got this title and position trying to pay back college fees right I'm being real these nah, things absolutely. are happening all in the midst of you trying to help somebody from a play a real place yeah nah, so it, sure. it's a complicated situation sometimes mm -hmm. when you're on the outside looking in and don't understand how to get in yeah. and not only that right? it, from absolutely. on the client part of it not everybody can afford to choose their um, their therapist because it's just whatever my insurance company will cover and they're yeah. gonna send me That's over here or whoever my doctor will send me to. Because I know some people who can't afford it and they'll say, well, I'm spiritual, so when I call around, I, I would ask, do you believe in God? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Because in order for you to counsel me, you have to also believe in him. If you don't believe in him, how can you turn around and counsel me? Right. So these are the things that a lot of people, if they are afforded the opportunity to, they should. Well, a good, I'm going to tell you this, as far as the faith aspect of it, a good psychologist or a good therapist, no matter what they believe, should be able to enforce, reinforce your beliefs. You understand? Uh, 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 a therapist or psychologist doesn't have to even believe in God to help you. The thing is, is that they, it's not like they're, they, they shouldn't try to make you believe what they believe. Right. If you, like again, that's like me working with somebody who believes in a different God than me. Yeah. Okay. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work within their belief structure. I'm gonna work within what they believe to strengthen them. You get what I'm saying? So a good therapist is gonna be able to treat some anybody. You get what I'm saying? Uh, regardless of faith. But if you have no knowledge about their type of faith, well, that's how why can you have. You? To, that's this is why you have to have knowledge. Okay. Of it. This is what I'm saying. Like I make it a I make it a point to not just know my culture. Correct. I make it a point to know a lot of different cultures. Okay. Because Man. because if I'm trying to build some kind of communication, if I'm a lot of things get lost in translation mm -hmm. between different cultures. You're right because you, know you might have a Hinduism, Buddhism, yeah, exactly. you know, exactly. Nawabuism, exactly. uh, Muslimic. I'm, I this seen, is all in the hood. Correct. I seen this is all uh, in the hood. I seen you beliefs. dealing with uh, Napoleon. I told you earlier, and, and uh, just him going through everything that he'd been through, including mm -hmm. the Pac stuff. You know, yeah. like to be able to reach out to those people. What's the? And, and I know you don't talk about client. Uh, situations are but what's the thing that sticks out to you that something that stuck out to you that that really you didn't you didn't see coming in 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 your therapeutic uh profession in general or with just him that you're talking about just in, in things that he, people he's he dealt with see, that's what I, yeah that that's what with. yeah i had that same question too what's, uh, what's a common denominator hmm. Nothing really surprises me. Nothing surprises you. I think it's because of my life experience. Correct, because you've been through so much already. <laughs> yeah, I know that in one second, everything can... can yeah, and you know that's what, what makes I, you good at what you do. Yeah. But w the way in which I want to ask it is, out of all your clients, what is the common denominator that you see affects all of them? 
That's there, a good that question. comes up constantly. The mind and the body are disconnected. Explain. Meaning, uh, your 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 brain. Okay, a lot of people think okay, your brain talks to your body, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't know that your body talks to your brain. Mm. A lot of people don't know that. All right. So with trauma, uh, you know, for instance, how does your body talk to your brain? I'm gonna tell you. So with trauma, okay. A lot of times your body, how you have muscle memory, mm -hmm. you ever like work out and then stop working out, mm -hmm. but then when you start again, you get it right back. Yeah. That's because your, your, your muscles have memory. Your heart, everything has muscle memory. Okay. So if, if your body remembers how it reacts to stressful events, when you get triggered, your body sometimes is going to mm -hmm. react before your mind even it knows what's happening. It up. Mm-hmm. So what I try to do is, is I try to connect people's minds with their body because if you listen to your body, a lot of times you won't feel overwhelmed because if you feel that tightness in your chest start to happen or wherever you feel it, some people feel it in their chest, some people feel it in their stomach, some people feel it in their shoulders, like you learn this through therapy. And you know exactly what it so is. So when you start feeling those things, you, you could, oh, wait a minute, I'm, about to, I'm, I'm stressing right now. All right, let me, all right, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm okay, I'm all right. You understand what I'm saying? You know, and, and it's so crazy that you have to, I have to watch how I expose people to that knowledge because if you went through sexual trauma, mm -hmm. people that have been sexually abused, I can't connect them with their body that fast. Some people ain't ready. Yeah. Mm. Because once they feel they're conscious of what their body's telling them, all these memories start to come. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have positive coping mechanisms that either I've exposed to them or if they've already know. They're gonna feel overwhelmed and they're just gonna shut down. Mm. Wow, you know what I'm Man. saying? So that's that's really a common denominator that I see a lot. Is that there's a detachment between mind and body. That's why I say mind, body, and soul. Mm -hmm. A lot this of that comes with age too, because as as I can only speak from me, but as I got older, I learned how to listen to my body. There you go. When you're younger, you just get up and go. You just do whatever. You think you're invincible. You're not thinking about nothing but yourself. You're not listening to your body. Or if you don't feel like that volcano about to blow. Right. What mm -hmm. about what about marijuana? I mean, is it something that medicinal? It, it, yeah, is it, they, they call it medicinal, but I mean, from my experience, I mean, if you anything that you abuse, it becomes something that's not good for you as well. I'm being real. Like like most people will run around and say, "Oh man, it's cool. It don't it don't it don't do nothing to you or whatnot." But then, from my experience, some of the people that do it, um, they don't be on top of their stuff. A lot of times, some of the people that are in in close vicinities with me actually shout out to my people. But it's just like and and and, I, and, I, and it's crazy. It's a crazy way to ask this question because it. It's a psyche too on your mind because you will be sitting there. Some people act high and act drunk. <laughs> yeah. no, don't play. You know this is happening, yeah, yeah. man. Oh, people, that's... people like to because I used to do it. I'm oh, the, yeah. I ain't drunk in years, but I remember it's a certain way you could act before you even get to the point <laughs> that you're drunk as you're acting. Yeah, that's because how, you're that's having fun. Placebo. That's how placebo works. Am placebo I right? Works. Yeah, I mean this. This is the thing. I approach every client. Individually, okay. No matter what it is, you know what I'm saying. Um, some people have more addictive personalities than others. Okay, exactly. Some people are more predisposed to things than others. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying. So, in psychology, we have a, a term called adaptive and maladaptive. Okay. Okay. Adaptive means that it's it's it works good towards your life, and it's a positive thing. Maladaptive is when it has a negative effect on your life. Okay. Whatever it is. Nothing is a problem until it becomes maladaptive. If somebody smokes weed, but they're on top of all that shit and it helps them. I don't mm -hmm. seen people do it. Okay. I got through my whole master's degree. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know have, people I who have, are like that. I, I have ADHD. Correct. But see, and, so and it helps me, calm you down. For me, make you focus. It helped me zero in a mm -hmm. little bit. Now, this is the thing, though. With other people, weed is not for everybody. You know what I'm saying? If 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 you smoke it and you find yourself being lethargic, you find yourself uh, uh, not being able to tend to your you business, know, your business yeah. or your family and stop or or get some help. You know what I'm saying? They have they have rehab for marijuana. 
You get what I'm saying? You know, same thing with oh, like alcohol. Do? Yeah, yeah. Same, same thing with yeah, alcohol. Same thing with like alcohol. This is the thing. I know some people who sip a little bit of wine every night. You know, and there's and it doesn't affect them negatively. Mm-hmm. Now, this is when you know you have a problem. It stops you from tending to your business, and you have a health problem that's being exacerbated by this use of the substance. Okay. If you can't, if you can't stop, even though this is threatening your life, mm-hmm. then you have a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. You know what I'm saying. So, so that's that, that's basically my answer to your question when yeah. it comes to like marijuana or, or any drug. Now, there's certain drugs where I'm like, you never should do that. <laughs> and this is the thing. I psychoanalyze. You know, I psychoeducate everybody that no, it's, I'm, I'm it's around. Some I done seen you know, these people. Sex, yeah. sex is the same thing. Same thing. So everything. You know, I, I, I tell you, everything you know, in moderation yeah, is I'd good. Say, except unless it's like meth. Yeah, of course. Crack, <laughs> of course. You know that, that type of shit. You know when you start getting into the meth and crack, I tell don't do that. Don't, don't ever start that. That don't. There's no good ending to that. Correct. So yeah, but weed, weed has never killed anybody. Yeah, we, exactly. And and that's the thing. We also got to understand that the government use a lot of their their resources to demonize marijuana to target a certain type of people exactly yeah yeah so we have to be able to re-educate ourselves about things but just you have to know yourself but like he was saying Mm -hmm. everything if you overdo it i would think it would um, affect you because even the people that i know who are productive smoking weed are people who will take two draws stop do what they gotta do and they're good yeah. The people who I know that can't function will sit down there and smoke the whole thing, get another one, smoke it again. Yeah. And then, yeah, you're you going to be... You're not going to get no more hired. Right. They just keep going. So, yeah. I done seen those two, those people too. Man, do you listen to music, right? Of course. Top three all artists of, of all time, dead or alive. Dead or alive. Top three. Top number three. one. Uh, number three. Okay. Number one for me would be Tupac. Tupac, number one. Number two. Bob Marley. Bob Marley number, number two. Ooh, it's gonna be a toss up between Sade and like Anita Baker. Damn, <clears throat> which one? You gotta pick one. That's a hard one. Boy. I'm gonna have to say God Sade. Damn. Yeah, I knew he was gonna say Cause that. Cause she had more hits than Anita you Baker because that. Anita Baker didn't have the longevity because of her attitude. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now there's a bunch of like but she you know, bad, though. but you know, but again, like you know, you give me a top ten, I'm gonna go no. in. I'm gonna be like, <laughs> I, I don't know why I thought that you, you might know. have even said Nipsey in your top three. No. Nah. Yeah, no. Nah, I mean, Nipsey's one of my favorite artists. I listen to all the time. I mean, again. I, I, you'd have me here for like a top 20 because I, I guess I listen to so many different types of music I love Nirvana I love I love all kind of music mm-hmm. so I will be here all night talking I have about one last question for you mm-hmm. so with all that counseling you do who counsels you? a therapist so you do go That's to dope. a therapist oh yeah I have to I mean because well, you have to unload all of that that people pack on to you well, as, well a lot of people don't know when you go to school and you, you get your degrees in this they make you go to therapy that's part of the program because you got to know what it's like to be on both sides of that. That makes sense. That, fence, that makes sense. And, 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 uh, but is that something yeah. that you're going to keep up all through your practice? You're going to keep going to the therapist? Yeah, well, the thing is, is like, again, knowing myself, I may not go every week. Mm-hmm. But I'll go enough to to when I need to, like, let off some of this. Yeah, this because... Steaming. Because I, I take in a lot of people. Yeah, stuff. that's what I was saying. Like, yeah. when people come to you and tell you all of this stuff and they cry, mm-hmm. you're not just a piece of concrete you have emotions you're gonna you know cry shed a tear because it's touching it's moving depends on the situation I've cried on, i mean i've cried on, I, you know I, when nip first died i remember me nick cannon and dame dash did a show about it and uh shout out to nick um i shed a tear yeah on stage live didn't you matter know, i didn't care i don't care because anybody that know me know i ain't no punk <laughs> so I don't, I don't think about stuff like that. No. So I, if, if a tear come, I'm gonna shed it. You know what I'm saying? That's part of me healing. I have to. You know he what said saying? a tear. What's, well, what I mean, when I said when I say shed a tear, I mean even if it's tears, you okay. know, I, I'm gonna I'm I, I'm gonna do it. You know what I'm saying? Okay. I mean that's part. Yeah, of Yeah, Nick how, Cannon cried on on his show when he yeah. lost his son. Oh yeah, I mean why and why not? Yeah, I mean you know. But I love. I love the transparency that a lot of people are showing in today's society because before it was a case where men shouldn't cry. So you're going to go behind closed doors and shed your tears. You will never come out in public and show certain things. But I love the fact that more people are trying to be more transparent. And I'm sure that people are not going to tell everything, but at least they're showing that I'm human. I'm not just this super 
superhuman person. Well, that's a problem, you know. Again, you know, hopefully we could talk again soon because that's a whole yeah. other, that's a whole other issue, you know. Uh, showing too much emotion in the hood can be considered weakness, mm -hmm. and when you're in a when you're in the hood with a bunch of wolves, it's real. Right. You know what I'm saying? If them wolves think you weak, they coming. That's mm -hmm. right. That's you know what so I'm saying? Right. So, you know, it, it's a legitimate issue well, you, that we have to address. You, you got a Texas connect now because we, yeah, yeah, I'm, you know I'm what I'm coming, saying? Like, like you, gonna, sure. you got to come down there. Yeah. We'll we set up. We, we're trying to set it up to where we can set up panels where people can come in and ask questions. Right. Yeah, nah, That's going to sure. be something that, like, I'm, we're going to try to start putting that together by the, definitely by 2023. To where when we do come to places, we can bring out some people and try to help some people. I think right. open panel conversations is I'm needed. Down. I think that's one of the big things that we can do to where people can feel like they're getting to be able to understand there's people like you and people they can get help from. And and that it used to happen more like talk shows would do it or whatever, but people are kind of not on that wave no more. We got to create a different way to our people for our people to come out and deal with us mm -hmm. on yeah, that no, level. I'm right down for all that. You and know, if somebody yeah. needed your help, um, whether they're in Texas or wherever, how, how can, can they, they get reach you? How can they? Um, they can they can hit me up on Instagram, uh, Tajay three one zero. It's a T A J E three one zero. That's 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 my handle on all my social media. Dope. So. Uh, you know, hit me up. You know, um, if I can't help you myself, I could I could point you in the right direction. You know, a lot of people. You know, a lot of people hit me from different states, and um, you know, I know y'all are legitimately going, going through issues. Just be patient with me because you know I, I'm I'm very busy as well. So it takes some time for me to answer all those messages sometimes, but I do answer them, mm -hmm. and um, I will definitely try my best to point you in the right direction if I can't. So a lot of therapists are doing, because um, since COVID, I think it helped a lot of therapists because you used to, you had to make appointments and you come in. Yeah. A lot of people are doing Zoom. Yo, Zoom. Oh, I, do, I do a lot of uh, virtual. Yeah. Virtual, because I have friends who yeah. do that too. And yeah. I'm like, okay. And, yeah. you know, I, try to help as, I try to help as many as possible. Obviously, I'm one man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, and you I try Zoom to, the room? Yeah, I, I do Zoom. <laughs> zoom the room. You yeah, do. you know, um, again, it, it's just, it, it's a lot because it, obviously... You got like you said, you were like a lot of people can't afford therapy, you know what I'm saying? And it's like it's a fine line between all right, well, I can, you know I can't everything can't be free, no, you can't. know what I'm saying? So it's like you know, and I try to help, I try to work with people's budgets as much as possible. A lot of times I give a lot of free, I you know, a lot of times I give a lot of free advice, right. yeah, you know, to yeah. people, you know what I'm saying? Um, but again, y'all know where my heart is at. If I can help, I will. And if I can't do it, I'm gonna point you In the right somewhere that, that can not help. You know, every state has some type of uh, uh, therapist thing where they work on sliding scales, you know what I'm saying, that are outside of insurance, they'll work with your budget. You know what I mean? And they you can see therapy. And it's crazy because a lot of the therapists like myself are in that. You arena. need to be inside of the juvenile facility helping these kids who constantly get in trouble. Oh, I've done that. I do that. I'm, I do that to this day. Okay. Thank you so much for coming on the show, man. We love you, brother. For sure. Love man, you too, bro. Yeah, man. I appreciate it. Me and Miss Jamaica are gonna much. ride with you. We riding with you now. Yeah. I'm so at the end of the day, if it's anything that we can do in Texas, uh, but we do travel a lot and whatever we can do with it, whenever you got something going, let us know, man. And uh, we so. can try to come together, man. Thank you so much for letting us come into your place here in Los Angeles, man. What's the name of this place, man? Uh, it's it's called Projector Space LA. Projector Space LA. We in the building, man. Yeah. We had a great time, man. My boy Todd, you let us in here. We here. We got some therapy for free. <laughs> let's, let's just go so, be man, real. Me too. We get, me yeah. too. Me too. <laughs> Anytime you can talk, I was going to ask you because I'm going to get out of this, but the more details, does it seem like you're getting better when you give more details in conversations about experiences that you've had? Absolutely. I think that would, that's what I was thinking about. Absolutely, because I get, I get used to being like y'all right. where I'm the one asking the questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it's, it, it's cool because, you know, again, I, I went through a lot of that stuff, so I, I need to unload sometimes. Man. So I appreciate it. Man, check it, man. Hey, man, it's your boy, ECEO, man. It's been another great segment of Boss Talk 101, where the bosses talk. And we yeah. out.